Hello, hello everyone. Thank you for joining us at our first HR Summit and Expo Digital Week. My name is Nina Sanova and I'm the Conference Director for HR Summit and Expo. Today, here with us, we've got two amazing people, great professionals and expert, experts in uh, people analytics, and it is my true honor to introduce them to you today. We will be talking about using people analytics to successfully manage and predict attrition. And here we've got Jordan Petman, who is the global head of people data analytics at Nestle. And we've got, and we've got as well Lorraine Adriansen, who is lead people data scientist at Nestle as well. So without any further ado, I would like to uh, give you Jordan, who will uh, do the introduction. Jordan? Thank you, Nina. And hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon or this evening or this morning, I guess, depending on where you're tuning in from. Um, so, yeah, a, a little bit about Nestle and about uh, the people analytics team there. Um, Lorraine, if you want to jump to the next slide and we can start to introduce people. So, Lorraine and I work in the people analytics function at Nestle. And, uh, and we have an interesting challenge. Uh, and I kind of like to share a little bit about Nestle um, in terms of our, our size and the sort of scale of businesses that we work with to really uh, give you a picture of the, the challenges that we So just waiting for that slide to populate. Beautiful. So um, Nestle, we're big, right? So around 89 billion in sales last year, we've got in excess of 300,000 employees. We're in more than 150 countries. That number kind of fluctuates a little bit depending on what's happening in, in the political landscape. We've got loads of factories in a lot of countries as well. We have over 2000 brands uh, and more than a billion products sold every day. And I think an interesting thing about Nestle, for me in particular, and why I'm an Australian by birth, who then lived in London for a number of years before moving to Switzerland and Nestle in uh, 2016. Uh, and when I took the tour in Nestle to see all of our brands, as we walked through, I saw a load of these brands that I would have sworn to you were very specifically Australian owned and Australian grown, very local brands that were in fact Nestle. And I think that's actually a really interesting part and a really interesting challenge that we have in the people analytics team in Nestle is that we are that big but at the same time we're very very local and uh, we we have uh, the 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 heart and soul of very local businesses that uh, are very entrenched in our communities and in the families that buy our products but at the same time uh, a very very global business if we look at the next slide we can see how that business has grown and changed across time uh, and so I say Nestle is a, a very local business serving our communities. Um, and, uh, and, and this Nestle story really speaks to exactly how that's grown and changed across time. So many people think of Nestle and they think of chocolate and they think of Kit Kat. And that's great because we make some very good chocolates and Kit Kat is delicious. Um, but not many people realize that uh, Nestle actually started as a, a an infant nutrition company. So in 1867, just after one of the Prussian wars it was, Dr. Henri Nestle relocated from Austria to Switzerland. Uh, and one of the women from the village Veve, which is where Lorene and I still work, that's, that's still where the Nestle headquarters is. One of the women in the village couldn't get her child to breastfeed. And uh, so she came to visit Dr. Nestle um, for some help. And Dr. Nestle invented baby formula. And that's actually where Nestle started. And you can see across time, uh, Nestle then joined in partnership in 1905 with a couple of American brothers who had a dairy business. And then from there, Nestle's businesses actually really changed rapidly, both via acquisition 
and by more organic means across time. You can see we started with some of our chocolate brands in Kaye, which is still one of the, the fanciest and my favorite chocolates. We started with coffee and Nescafe, and then across time, our, our brands, which really started to speak to Nestle's purpose, which is all around enhancing the quality of life through health, wellness, and nutrition. You know, those brands that we've built out across time really speak to that. So we, we have coffees, we have Maggie, which is huge in, in a lot of Asia, uh, and Oceania with all of our food stocks and what have you, a load of different water brands. There are, um, there are confectionery brands, there's uh, brands that support our, our man's best friend and our dogs and cats. Um, lots of things like ice cream, and then more. More recently, we have more of our our consumer pharmaceuticals. So a lot of brands in our uh, Nestle Health Science, Nestle Skin Health, um, really contributing around that brand portfolio that's all around health, well-being, and nutrition. And so, if you consider Nestle as a single company but a single company that actually looks very, very different depending on which part of the world you engage with our brands. We have a really interesting story to tell about how we're able to support each of the leaders of those different businesses to use people analytics to drive all of their better people decision-making processes. So Lorene, if we jump to the next one. Again, the way that we're organized um, actually lends a little bit to our our simplicity but also to our complexity as well. So if you consider Nestle as one big business, we have that one outcome that we're driving towards which is creating and, and enhancing quality of life of people, communities and, and the planet. And we do that by the way that we're organized. So we have all of Nestle which is our biggest sphere that you can see there on the left. Uh, and then within that sphere, we're kind of divided into three different geographies in the way that we organize ourselves. So some of our big brands like Nespresso that you might all know is a globally managed business. So that's that big blue sphere that you can see. Then the next sphere down is then our zones. We're divided into three zones. So where our businesses don't have a global management point of view, they do then have a management point of view that is either the Americas, um, Europe, the Middle East, and North Africa, or Asia, Oceania, and Africa. And then within those zones, we have our locally managed businesses, which are our markets. Uh, so that the market that Lorene and I both sit in is Switzerland. The market that the HR Forum sits in is Nestle Middle East, which is around 16 countries that all club together to be a market. So our, our markets could be single country. Um, they could be very, very simple markets with a single one of those 2000 brands. They could be very complex markets like the Middle East, where we're one business but split across 16 different geographies with many of those different um, businesses. And so if we then uh, roll to the next one, Loreen, if we then consider what Loreen and, and my challenge is, is that in our global people analytics function, we've been given the challenge by our chief HR officer to make sure that all Nestle businesses have got access to and the capability to work with people analytics teams and outcomes to drive better people decisions in their businesses. And that's their businesses anywhere. So it could be one of our globally managed businesses, it could be a zone, it could be a market, it could be a single brand within a country within a market. So uh, a really rounded approach to being able to deliver that same kind of robust decision-making capability, regardless of the size of the business we're working with. We're driven to ensure that all of our analytics are useful and actionable by the business. Uh, and that's a really core driver for us. We work with a bunch of really clever people. We have some data scientists, we have some industrial organizational psychologists, we have some uh, expert management information people, we have some strategic workforce planners, we have some business consultants. And regardless of what we would love to spend our time doing, and that could be about driving loads and loads of different uh, statistical models to answer all kinds of questions. We really don't spend a lot of time doing those things if we're not directly answering something that the business is asking us for. And the last piece there is that we develop a model that enables any of our businesses to engage directly with us. Uh, and that model we're trying to deploy via a globally networked organization 
our next slide talks a little bit to that. So you might see talking about the, the build of, um, of functions within HR as being quite hierarchical. So having a, uh, a head of talent, for example, or a head of reward, and having zone leadership that report to them or having business, ship, business leadership that report to them in a really structured way across a global organization. We've very deliberately taken a, a different path. And what we've decided is that because we need to be directly led by business and we need to make sure that the analytics that we deliver are directly impacting on the business decisions that our leaders are taking and that those businesses could be big global businesses based in Switzerland or very local businesses based in the Africas or in Latin America or, or what have you. We've decided to build a global people analytics functional network. And that means that we have leadership that works with myself as our global lead in a range of hubs across the world that support each of our businesses um, wherever they happen to be. Uh, and so we're, we're a much flatter organization, we're truly driven by the organizations that we work for and that we work with. Uh, we, and we leverage the scale of Nestle, remembering that we're 300,000 plus people. We leverage our scale to be able to ensure that when we build something that really works for one business, that we leverage this globally networked function to understand where we could leverage that same set of analytics somewhere else, that we could leverage that same process, that same methodology in a business that has similar challenges so that we're really getting the most from our analytics network in a, in a function that's really growing in Nestle so far. Uh, and I think what we really wanna share with you today uh, is an example of one of the things that we're having a really huge amount of success with in our business. And that really falls into our predictive analytics bucket in our, in our fourth point. Broadly, that network looks after four big kind of buckets of work. So our first one is around strategic workforce planning. And that really helps us to link the business and the way that the business thinks about the way that their workforce is changing, their skills are changing across time, and helping them to think strategically about how they might forecast where they need to grow skills, where they need to shrink skills, where they need to cross skill, where they need to address uh, things like retirement risk or heavy turnover risk to business execution through using all of the statistical methodologies that we have to forecast um, trends that are happening within our HR measures. We also deliver a load around our key HR metrics. Inside of that key HR metrics, the KPIs and dashboards, we have really key responsibility for HR data standards um, and understanding how we're able to drive standardization in the way that we think about key measures like headcount or FTE or the number of terminations we have and the reasons that they leave through to delivering pretty standardized visualizations of each of those things to our business leaders so that they're able to look at the same visualization anywhere in the business and really be drawing the same insight from that piece of information to drive better decision making everywhere. Descriptive analytics is really around helping our HR partners in our businesses to really understand what their data is telling them. So how they can use some pretty structured methodologies around root cause analysis or segmentation of their workforce to dive into where the, the peak drivers of those key KPIs that are appearing in those dashboards are. And then the really exciting stuff, I think, is where we're able to use analytics methodologies and analytics frameworks to help our business leaders to understand what it is in their business that's really having an influence over some outcome measures. So understanding where driving a change in the way that new joiners to our business stay with our business, understanding where we're able to leverage uh, HR interventions to get people to stay longer, to really have an impact on some of our business measures like the cost of turnover or our net net sales or our organic growth or our profit. And it's that space in our predictive space that Lorene, who is our lead people data scientist at Nestle, has spent 
most of her time working uh, to, to support our leaders to make better decisions based on what she's able to pull together in terms of the relationships that we can find with HR data and with some of their business outcome data. And then Lorene, would you like to take over here and really work, walk us through one of those examples that you've been rolling out in six or seven markets now, I think? Yeah, sure. Thank you, uh, Jordan, for that nice introduction. And thank you all for joining this uh, webinar. So as Jordan mentioned, I, today I will share with you uh, about one of our predictive people analytics projects being a flight risk analysis. So if I jump to the next slide, and I hope this still works. Come on, move it. All right, we're there. So. Flight risk analysis is truly one of the most widely investigated topics in people analytics because employee churn can incur a colossal cost to the organization. And being able to find the key factors related to voluntary termination can help you to effectively target and fine tune your retention strategy. So when we started this research, we were thinking about what the actual question was. Since well, let's face it, all employees will eventually leave the organization they're part of, whether it be it through retirement or separation. We found it more important to answer the question, when will employees leave versus whether they will leave? And because time until turnover was our main outcome of interest, we decided to move ahead with survival analysis. Survival analysis is generally defined as a set of methods for analyzing data where the outcome uh, variable is the time until the occurrence of an event of interest being turned over in our case. Um, it's generally uh, of interest to describe the relationship of a factor of interest being treatment in a clinical trial or a promotion in our context to the time of event and that in the presence of other covariates such as age, gender, work location, etc. Talking about one of the major advantages of survival analysis is that it can deal with censored observations. So censored observations are observations uh, where the information about their survival time is incomplete. So let's consider me, my, uh, myself and Jordan, um, if People analytics would run a regression, um, a survival analysis model uh, considering all of HR in Nestle in Switzerland. We could potentially be a part of uh, the data set, but for us, we have not yet um, I, um, observed the event of interest being voluntary turnover. So, with survival analysis, we can still include the information that in the two or three years' time that we have been part of this organization. With this set of characteristics, we have still not decided to leave the company. So, um, talking about that. And another nice feature um, is that it can handle changes in characteristics during the car career of an employee. Um, using time dependent covariates, you can make your analysis less static compared to other more commonly used uh, classification models a logistic regression being uh, one of those. So maybe as a short illustration for the importance of using time-dependent variables, uh, I could share this example. So uh, a while ago, a bunch of researchers uh, wanted to investigate the effect of winning an, an Academy Award on the life expectancy. And from their research, it appears that the life expectancy was 3.9 years longer for Oscar award winners than other less recognized performance. So how did they come to this result? What they did was basically fit a normal, uh, very general Cox proportional hazards model with whether a performer ever wins an Oscar in his or her lifetime treated as a time independent covariate and they measured the survival from the performance date of birth. Later, it was pointed out that this analysis suffers from immortal time bias. So for a winner, the time before winning is immortal time. Uh, and it refers to a period of the follow-up during which it's, it's not possible to have uh, the event because obviously they had still had to win the award. So to eliminate this, they've um, the other researchers fitted a Cox model with 
um, winning status treated as a time-dependent covariate. And from those results, it appeared that winning an Oscar still had a slight positive effect on the lifetime, but it was no longer statistically significant. So what can you use in the, in, for survival analysis as an input in the context of um, yeah, flying the flight risk uh, for your employees? It's basically everything. Um, we can look at demographical variables, age, gender, commuting distance, previous experience, etc. But also events that occur during an employee's career. We can look at the relationship of survival time with training, promotions, salary increases, international assignments, and so on. And also, it's important to take into account of what is happening in the environment around the employee. How is the business perform performing? What is the team uh, he or she is part of like? How many external opportunities are there for this specific skill set? So these are all things you can include um, in the modeling. Basically, if you have a way of measuring a certain uh, variable of interest, you can include it. And these can then uh, yeah, yield themselves to input for these analysis. So you can start from the very basics with a uh, log rank test, uh, move into modeling with uh, proportional hazards models, or move into the machine learning space with survival trees and random forests. Um, so now to make this all a bit more realistic, uh, I want to illustrate the, the approach with an example. Of course, due to the sensitive nature of the data, I'm not able to share real results, but uh, only results from a simulated data set. I hope most of you are familiar with the series Game of Thrones. Um, for those who have yet to watch it, I would like to give the advice of not getting too emotionally um, connected to any of the characters. So let's suppose you are the HR manager of the Night's Watch. The Night's Watch is a group of people whose task is to defend the, uh, the Westeros against an army of White Walkers. So as the HR manager, you are experiencing quite a high turnover in this group of people, and you would like to investigate on how you can bring that number down. So after you have thought about the problem and about the hypothesis you want to test, it's time to collect and clean your data, which is speaking as a data scientist who does 90% of this is really the most fun time of all. So you start by defining your sample. Um, you usually want to target all employees who join between a specific time frame, and you follow the behaviors and characteristics of this cohort through time. First, you capture the start and end dates, and then you rescale them, so um, you rescale the, the timings, so they start all at the baseline time. Next, you add um, the time-independent variable. So these are characteristics that won't change over time. And then finally, you can add time-dependent variables to your data and make sure that you structure your data in a long format so that each timing is reflected with the right set of characteristics. So in survival analysis, the aim is to invest, uh, estimate the sur survival function or the hazard function. And because of the mathematical structure, it's easy to derive the survival function when you have modeled the hazard function or vice versa. The survival curve represents a fraction of employees that are still with the companies uh, after X amount of time. And the hazard function represents the instantaneous risk of having the event at time X. So from this estimated survival curve using the Kaplan-Meier estimator, we can see that the median survival time here is 28 months, meaning that 50% of the night watch employees have left before completing 28 months of service. What value or insights can survival analysis bring to you? First, it allows you to test specific hypotheses. Is there a difference in survival time between different subgroups? In this example, we have performed the mantel hensel log rent log rank test, sorry, to compare the different origins of the night's watch. And we have found that not all employees had the same probability of survival based on where they came from. Second, um, 
through the process of model building, you can find the main drivers of turnover. Here we have started with the plain vanilla Cox proportional hazard model and have ended with a dynamic prediction model based on a landmarking supermodel. So from the output, for example, here uh, we can see that each additional month of on-the-job training lowers the risk of leaving with more than 5%, which you can see here in the hazard ratio column. Next, you can apply the coefficients of your estimated model to your current population and assess the risk for each individual employee. So accurate predictions can then enable you to take action for retention or succession planning of these employees. And finally, I want to mention uh, the importance of competing events. By using competing events, you can model the cost-specific hazards for different type of events simultaneously. So by using this methodology, you can find out what is driving employees that leave because they want to grow in their career versus employees that leave because they want to go in a completely different direction. What is the technology I use for this? Um, that would be mainly R, uh, which is statistical software that can run almost every uh, statistical model you can think about. It's open source uh, and currently universi universities uh, are massively adopting this technology, uh, whether before it was more SPSS and SAS. And through this huge uh, user community, it's very easy to solve uh, almost all of the problems you encounter during analysis. You can just simply Google them and somebody before you will already have experienced it and found a solution for it, so that's great. Um, second of all, uh, I make uh, also a lot of use of Shiny, which is an add-on for R and it um, allows you to create apps so that you can deploy statistical models and have users play around with their data. And thirdly, uh, I also use Power BI. Um, it's a tool to create live dashboards and I'm sure a lot of you are aware of, of the technology. Um, why I like it is because it can connect directly to your databases, so you only need to build a report once and the next time you can just update the data to update the report. Plus, it also includes an R module so you can really customize, customize your analysis and your outputs to your needs. And then I would like to conclude with some tips from a statistician for when your organization wants to move uh, from reporting into predictive analytics. First tip uh, is to always check your model assumptions. Running any type of statistical model is a great way of looking at trends in your data but there are assumptions uh, your data must meet in order for these results to be valid. So always make sure to pay attention to those. Uh, second tip is around correlation. Um, so when you see correlation between two variables, don't go out and automatically assume that there's a causal relationship between them. It takes very rigorous research and experimentation to, um, to examine causality which of course in an HR context is not always possible. Um, so be careful when you see any type of results implying the existence of a causal relationship. Um, thirdly, stay true to the scientific method. You should always start with the question you are asking. Clearly formulate your hypothesis you want to test, collect your data necessary for this, and finally run the analysis and interpret your results. It's really the business question that should drive the analysis, not the data you have at hand. Um, Niels Bohr once said, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. Uh, and I wanted to use this quote as a warning of the importance of testing a forecasting model out of sample. So it's often easy to find a model that fits the past data well, but quite another matter to find a model that correctly identifies those features of the past which will be replicated in the future. And finally, adjust your language depending on your audience. Um, I had to learn that just because I think statistics are cool and interesting, others might not be always as interested in all the technical details. So make sure that you communicate clearly about the analysis and results in a way that is helpful for the person that will use those results in further discussions. That's it.
I think statistics are interesting too, Lorraine. It's okay. Great. Yay. I think there is a questions um, section at the bottom, so maybe we can take a look at those. Yeah. So we did have two questions. One was about our tools. So maybe you want to give a little bit of a, a further overview around when you would use R versus the other tools that uh, that we would use. Sure. Um, so R I use mainly for data cleaning, data wrangling, uh, model building. Uh, so this is 70% of my time I would spend using uh, R. And I try to avoid Excel as much as possible because the data sets I usually work with are quite large and um, Excel is not always the best in handling those. Um, if I want to make analysis available to others, so meaning others that not necessarily have a statistical uh, background, but I want to kind of give them the opportunity also explore their own data, I can use Shiny. Um, it's a great tool to build um, dashboards, but you can also yeah, include relatively easy regression models in there, and then other people can uh, go and explore a little bit on their side. And then um, Power BI I use ma mainly if I want to present uh, results. Uh, so I think it's really easy there that you can slice and dice uh, your analysis and really do it live. So I do not need to go back to my desk when somebody asks me, oh, I kind of want to see this result, but just for the sales population, I just apply the filter and everything updates. So I hope that answers the question. Super. And then Julie's got a couple of good questions as well. So we had a question about um, how far is our attrition historical data that we use in order to build analysis and predictive models. And I've said we have about 10 years of, of people data, but it varies market to market. So Lorene, I guess you can speak a little bit more to you know, how far back data is meaningful and how far back it, it goes to, to the impact on data cleansing and all of that sort of stuff as well? So, um, yeah, generally, the further we move back in the in the past, uh, the worse our data quality gets. So, um, yeah, I usually try to find the sweet spot between not too much data cleaning, but still getting a representative sample uh, to do your analysis. Uh, what is important to note is that when you're uh, thinking about constructing your sample, it's you want to specify a population that you can assume that will behave similarly to, to your current population. So um, field sales representatives 10 years ago might not have the same um, behaviors or um, aspirations as they might have today. So it's important to take that also into account when, when constructing your sample. I think that speaks a lot to Julie's next question as well, which is around um, whether we use the same hypothesis or not, or if we would use different uh, hypotheses depending on the location that we're in. The example that Julie gives is uh, the Middle East. So would we use a different uh, hypothesis for the Middle East, given that there are lots of expats there um, versus a country that, that potentially has a more permanent workforce? Yeah, we sure do. Um, so that's what I tried to mention uh, in the slide where I said, what, what kind of variables can you include? Um, and all of our analysis starts with uh, a good conversation with the business partners uh, to ensure that we get their feedback as well and that we can include those remarks or their hypothesis in the model so we can make them very uh, local as well. Beautiful. Another good question, since we're using predictive models, how do we foresee about the technology in, in the HR process? We hear a lot about uh, industry experts using artificial intelligence and blockchain and, and so on. So what, what's your view, Lorene, on uh, emerging technologies and how that will change HR process? Um, I think the, yeah, the inclusion of more technology is definitely a good thing. Um, what I would be cautious of is that these models often imply a certain black box and not everybody is uh, as aware of what is happening on the back end of those models. So I think it's very important for professionals to, um, yeah, to be aware of what's happening. Um, also, some of machine learning algorithms are not always um, 
uh, offering the yeah the flexibility uh, that is needed to solve certain business questions. You, I would really prefer a statistician to um, engage with the data and look for the trends and fine tune the model in order to find the optimal solution in order of, well, compared to a, yeah, an automated model that uh, that spits out a result, but you're not really have, yeah sure of what yeah. is happening. I think I would totally agree. I think um, it, uh, technology is changing and improving so rapidly um, that I think the impact for HR really needs to be a, a consideration that we all make for our HR teams. You know, uh, as Lorraine says, we, we can teach a, an algorithm to predict who's going to leave the organization. But if, as an HR person, I'm unable to make that meaningful to the business and I'm unable to have a discussion about what might be driving the results of that predictive model, and I'm unable to have discussion around the sorts of interventions that I might put in place as an HR person or as a business person, the the output of a fancy tool and a new piece of technology is is a wonderful thing, but if it's not usable, it's not usable. So I th think the implication for us is really less about whether we're using the newest, fanciest technology and really about whether we're making sure our HR population is enabled to understand what those new technologies are, to understand the way that they can use those new technologies to support their business a little bit better. So I don't think that we can have one conversation without the other. A question from Ishmael, how important is data cleansing when we have to move towards a predictive model? It's an issue that they face as they have data back as far as 12 plus years. Tell us, Lorene, how much do you love data cleansing and how important is it? Do, do you really want me to use ugly words in this webinar? Um, no, so, clean words yeah. only, please. <laughs> so yeah, it's a quite um, yeah significant amount of time that is uh, invested in data cleaning. Um, again, depending on the context or what kind of variables you want to include, um, it's it's quite extensive. <laughs> I'm currently running a project with uh, one of our businesses where we're trying to look at how can we predict future performance. Um, and I think I've, I'm trying to combine data from more than 20 sources and it's, it's a, yeah, it's a massive job. So, um, but the good news is as well uh, as people analytics is gaining more, um, appetite in the business, people also start to understand more what's the value of clean data and whereas before they would not pay as much attention, this is really improving and in the in the long run this will this will really benefit the people analytics function. I would agree. I think in that space it's you know we hear about um, organizations who get stuck in that cycle of data cleansing and really striving to have 100% data accuracy before they get on and do any of the actual analytics. And I think that there's a really fine line that a people analytics function needs to walk between cleansing the data to a point that it is sufficient to be able to run the sorts of statistics that you're trying to do to inform business decisions and cleaning it to 100% cleansed. Um, and I think that, that it, it, it's, a, it's a bit of a gray space I think, and I don't think that it's a, a particularly hard line. I think the degree to which your data needs to be cleansed is directly related to how confident your business leader needs to be in the data that they're using to make their decisions. So if your business leader is comfortable with a representative sample that gives them the confidence to make the decisions about their entire population, then you don't need to go and clean 100% of the population because there's that there, there's a diminishing return on the extra effort that you put into cleaning versus supporting that business leader to make a decision based on that 80-20 rule. Um, so I don't think that there is a, a, a perfect silver bullet, although Lorene would absolutely tell you that it has to be 100% clean. But then Lorene is a statistician and, and I am not. Um, yeah, uh, that's how are management and leadership? Sorry. Well, no, that's your perfection, Lorene. 
you're a perfectionist. Um, how are management and leadership reacting to insights and learnings that we're showing them? Are they excited, skeptical, or a mix of these? Um, that's a really excellent question, Luke. And I think that early in our journey, um, I think that our leadership were less skeptical and more surprised that this was the sort of information that HR was trying to bring to them to help them to make their decisions. I think Nestle has been on a, a, a bit of a journey in the last 18 months, two years, where previously we'd have seen analytics as you know a, a thing that a group of people sat in a room and pushed out reports and dashboards. Um, and that was kind of the expectation that the business had. So I wouldn't say that the business was skeptical um, of the insights that we were pre presenting to them, but they were certainly surprised. Um, and it did take us a little bit of time to get that buy-in that actually this is what you should expect from a people analytics team. These are the skills that we have. This is all of the reasons. This is all of the data cleansing that we've done. These are all of the external benchmarks that we've looked at. This is how we know that the data that we're presenting you is good and is sufficient for you to make decisions with. Um, and I think we sort of crossed that line between surprised and excited and actually demanding more, probably at about the 12 month mark, um, where we now are actively engaged with the leadership of the organization in markets and in our globally managed businesses and in our zones where they're really pointing us at the problems that they don't have an answer for that they can use analytics to get one for. So we've moved to a, a space of true partnership, which I think is really exciting. Question from Amritha, based on your analysis, what are the top five reasons for high attrition rate? I am going to uh, politely decline answering this one. And the reason I'm going to do that is that in a business as big as Nestle, and again, we're talking about over 300,000 people, we're in more than 150 countries, we're across about 50 markets. The reasons that people leave the organization are different business to business. Um, and we could give you a list of five per business that we had done this with. So I, I don't think that there is a, a silver bullet in telling you what the top five reasons people leave organizations are. And if I could tell you, then it would be the usual list, right? It would be that people joined for the good company but left for a bad manager or people joined for a good company but left because they could be paid more somewhere else. You know, it's th those kind of trends that you see in the usual HR blogs is, is what's going to show up. But I truly think that that kind of thing, it varies business to business and I would be doing you a disservice to give you a, a top five. Uh, question from Mamta, since the data is too large, how do we manage reporting in a market zone level? Um, so I guess I can feel this one, Lorene, and this is um, based on some work that we're doing in our HR transformation. We are currently working with success factors to move to a single source of data for all of our businesses all over the world. And that means that we're using um, a single set of data structures by which to report. So in the reporting space, and I wrote a blog about this a couple of weeks ago now, in the reporting space, we don't want to play. So my people analytics team can report and we're responsible for delivering the standard dashboards that, that businesses interact with, but they're, um, they're, it's not a space that we want to spend a lot of time in. And so the way that we do that is by helping the organization to standardize their data set so that we can build one set of reports, one set of dashboards, and then we can control the lines access to that information through their role-based permissions that they access the rest of the HR system with. So very specifically, we, we manage reporting and dashboards by managing the data structures that people have access to and doing it that way, rather than deploying a really heavy reporting team across time. A uh, good question. And for you, Lorene, what prior courses or skills are required to use statistical tools like R? Um, so R has quite a steep learning curve. Um, so I, yeah, you will need a statistical uh, skill sets in order to um, use R for the statistical modeling. I mean, you can still use it for data cleaning, 
Uh, but if you really want to start with model building, you really need to make sure that you know what you're doing, that you know how to test assumptions, how you can uh, yeah, impact your models, how you can transform your data in order to make those assumptions work. Um, so yeah, I would say a statistical skill set is required in order to move. Definitely help. Uh, or, yes. Uh, what does that not mean? I mean, you don't need to have the statistical uh, skills inside. You borrow the skills from your business analytics um, if you have those uh, available elsewhere in the company. And another question from Julie, what kind of framework has HR developed in order to retain the employees that were predicted to leave? And this one, I guess is answered, uh, is connected to that previous answer in that depending on which part of the business it is, very, very different things have happened. So in one of our businesses, they identified that they were actually able to identify people that they wanted to retain earlier. And so they put into place a, um, I guess it's a, a stay intervention. So they did things like uh, stopped doing exit surveys because they were actually able to predict relatively uh, consistently the people that they expected to leave and they were able to deliberately focus one-to-one -one discussions with those people that were identified as likely to leave that we really wanted to stay. Uh, in other parts of the organization, uh, variable pay was identified as being uh, a key driver. And so the HR director in that part of the business worked directly with their management committee to review their, their variable pay strategy for, for the next period. In another part, it was around leadership. And so a leadership development um, addition was kind of added to the things that we teach our leaders. And it was about how to help those leaders to identify people that were exhibiting the uh, characteristics of people that were likely to leave, and then how to identify which of those that they'd like to stay and, and support them to be better leaders of the people that we were wanting to stay. So again, it really has depended on the driver of termination. But I think the really cool thing and speaking to the, the point that we made previously around whether the business is excited or not, my measure of whether the business is excited about the insights that we give them is whether they do anything with it. And I think a really cool thing for us is that we can directly see that when the business has this information to make better decisions, they are genuinely doing different things in their businesses to address the drivers of attrition. How can we update data according to new changes of needs of customers and new competitors and change of customer life level? I'm not entirely sure what that question is asking. If that's you that's asked that question, can you clarify in the text? Another question for you, Lorene, how do we avoid bias when building an algorithm to answer a hypothesis? Um, yeah, I would say focus really on good design of your study. Um, make yeah, good design is always the best uh, pill against uh, a lot of sources of bias. Um, just make sure uh, not to have your pre-assumptions lead the analysis and really let the data speak. Super. And a question from Sumit. We have, what would be your suggestion to an HR professional who wants to start a career as an HR data scientist? How should one begin considering he or she doesn't have a stats background? So I think maybe there's two answers for this. And Lorene, do you want to go first and then I'll go second? Because I think you and I have a different view. <laughs> um, oh, it, it really depends on how far you want to Take this. I mean, there's a lot of online courses that can uh, tell you the principles of data analytics, data visualization, uh, machine learning algorithms uh, that do not require a very specific or uh, hardcore statistics background. Uh, but of course, um, if you want to make sure that you're uh, doing research in a really rigorous and um, yeah way, uh, make sure that you make the correct inferences, I would say that a, yeah, a university degree or a scholar degree uh, in statistics would be a requirement, but Jordan might have a different opinion. No, I was going to say I, I actually probably concur there. So 
I wouldn't call myself a data scientist. So if I look at my career, you know, I, I have a psychology undergraduate degree, then I had a, a business master's, and then I worked in consulting. And so I, by trade, like I'm an HR strategy person and I'm an analytics person, but the last time that I did proper statistics was during psychology. And that was, I won't tell you how long ago that was because that would reveal my age, but it was some time ago. Now, if you want to be a data scientist, data science is all about statistics. Um, and the, the newest, coolest bits of data scientists, things like um, using machine learning and using artificial intelligence and all of that sort of stuff, you know, it's the, that piece is actually just applying new technologies to statistical methodologies and to statistical frameworks. So if you want to get into data science, then I'm afraid you need to go and learn how to be a statistician. Um, and Lorene is absolutely right. If you want to be a people analytics driven HR person, then I think your path into that career path could be really, really different. Um, you know, I think that there are some key things that you need to have in your skill set in order to approach HR problems from an analytics point of view. Um, and that is around being able to approach a problem logically, um, being able to use methods like deductive and inductive reasoning to understand how you can break down a problem into what actually drives that problem and seek to find information to either support or refute what you're thinking are the drivers for that particular, um, that, that particular happening inside of HR. Now, do you need statistics in order to follow through a problem in a logical way and to then be able to tell a story to business leaders around what and why the driver of a particular problem is happening? No, I don't think you do. Um, so I guess it really depends on whether you're talking about HR data science, which is definitely about going and getting a statistics qualification, or is it about being a data-driven HR person and supporting the business to make decisions with data. You know, I, I think you can be the latter without having to be a data scientist, but you need to make sure that you've got data scientists to work with. Um, and so I would say, you know, industrial organizational psychology is one way to get in there. Um, general business is another way to get in there. There's a load of interesting learning that you can do um, through things like TED Talks or Coursera or what have you that will teach you about storytelling. Um, and then I guess, you know, getting into a, a people analytics practice where you're able to learn all of the different component parts of what a people analytics team does. So you don't need to be that unicorn like, like I, I often describe Loreen. Loreen is a statistician. She is, in fact, a psychologist. She can storytell. She is able to work with the business in a consultancy way and help them to articulate their problems in a way that she can then approach with statistics and then tell a story back to them so that they understand what's going on. You don't need to have all of those skill sets all at once and you can learn each of those skill sets differently by building out a bit of, a bit of a portfolio career looking at reporting and then analytics and then maybe some statistics and then maybe some strategic planning and building that all together. Question from Farida about the allowed turnover rate for Nestle. Again, very, very different um, depending on, on the part of the business that we're working with. Some of our business works in factories and distribution centers. Some of them work in offices. Some of them work on the road in, in field sales. And then again, we're in loads of different geographies. We, we operate in very different competitive environments. We really don't have um, one particular number that we all try to roll up to. Is the time series analysis and regression analysis really helpful in HR planning, specifically manpower planning? Absolutely. So we use things like uh, time series and regression in looking at forecasting our turnover rates in different business units. We'd look at it in forecasting our retirement risk in different business units. We'd look at it in forecasting things like the required FTE that we need in places like our factories if we're looking at using production units as a, a unit of outcome. So that, that's absolutely something that we would look at. Any other simple software and user-friendly for HR analytics from Heba? I would say, what, Excel and PowerPoint, Lorene? What else do you think? <laughs> Um, yeah, sure. Well, Excel is great. Um, yeah, it's, it's a great tool to look at your data and to visualize it. 
uh, and to store it. But um, yeah, I'm I'm not personally a fan, but but I do use it. <laughs> um, <laughs> And of course, yeah, PowerPoint. You need to re present your results in a in a nice way to the business um, in order to to tell the story and to make sure that they can uh, take those results further and act upon it. Exactly. Great question from Allah. Uh, how do we determine what data in HR is useful for analytics and actually adds value to the business? That question, my friend, you should ask of your business. So, in and of itself data has no value data just is and it's the things that we do with it and the questions that we seek to answer with it that gives it value so what hr data is valuable in your business could be very different to the hr val data that's valuable in my business and depending on the sort of business that i'm working with inside of nestle it varies all the time so to answer that question what i encourage you to do is speak to the leaders of the business that you're working with and ask them not about what data they're interested in don't ask them what KPIs they want to see from HR. Ask them what decisions they're having trouble making about their people and what insight you could bring them that would make that decision making easier. And they will then tell you what information they need. Uh, what are the three best analytics tools to successfully manage and predict attrition in a small size to mid sized business? I think Lorene and I would both tell you that it's going to be R if you're going to use a statistical model to uh, to successfully manage and predict attrition. You want to use R and you want to use a statistical model that ma matches the sort of business environment that you're working in. And last one, do we believe that in the near future we will see growing role for AI in guiding the data-driven decision based on this or is it still premature, especially talking about predictive data related to a human being? Khaled, I think that AI is, well, it's not even in the near future, it's happening now. Um, artificial intelligence is used all the time. And as I said, it's just a new way to use statistical modeling to answer um, questions. And artificial intelligence you know, uses all of the same frameworks and models that Lorene would use in the work that she does. It's just a computer doing it, so it can do it faster than Lorene does because she's one person and a computer is able to do things that a statistician can do much, 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 much faster. So is it about to be a big thing? It absolutely is about to be a big thing. What do we need to make sure that we're doing as HR professionals? We need to make sure that we understand what those AI models are teaching us. We need to understand what the insights are and we need to be the people that take that to the business to make sure that they're able to use it to make their decisions better because ultimately the results of an AI model is no different to the results of a, a model that a statistician has built you probably just got those results faster you have less ability to explain what's in them if you don't already understand what's gone into building the, the statistical model underneath And I think we've got time for one last question from Rawad. So do we recommend combining mathematic forecasting and judgmental forecasting? I've had an incident with a line manager where I presented a regression analysis between salespeople and achieved sales and the correlation was high. He wasn't convinced about the number, but I tried combining his estimation with the regression analysis. Lorraine, what would you say here? Um, I'm not entirely sure um, what you mean by including the line manager's, manager's estimation in the model. Um, but I think what is important to note is that when a, I mean, a regression model always gives you a coefficient of a parameter based on a lot of data. And there's always going to be individual um, there, um, yeah, deviations from that number. So um, yeah, it's always, it's also necessary to explain to a line manager that these results are on average taken over a, a much bigger population. So if his results is deviating from that, it might already, um, yeah, that might already explain uh, some of the concern. Um, and otherwise, um, I would recommend sticking to things you can really measure. Um, of course, having those inputs from a line manager is important, but I and mean, then there's a certain way that he calculates or she calculates uh, his or her number. Um, so I would yeah, go back and forth, see where it differs from what you are doing and try 
to find the midway or find the try to find the right solution there. Uh, I think I would agree, Lorraine. I think it's important uh, that we. You know, I think the the question is around um, whether whether we should allow managers to continue to do things without the the benefit of analytics. I think there is the the reality is that HR has existed for a lot longer than the practice of people analytics has, and HR has been doing a great job for all of that time. So as the new kids on the block, I think we have a responsibility to you know, take into account the 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 beliefs that are held by the business leaders that we're working with, and help them to see where their beliefs fit what is actually happening and where maybe they need to change those beliefs. Um, and I think that's about the influence that in HR we need to have. You know, the maths alone is just going to give them a different number to what they had in their head. It's our role to really make sure they understand how that maths had come to be, that if they're challenging it because they believe something else, that you're able to walk them through understanding what's in your data set and potentially do a bit of change management um, with them to help them to start to appreciate the data a bit more. Uh, and definitely our last question from uh, Mohammed. Uh, are our data scientists completely authorized to collect and analyze any data related to our predictive analysis or do we need a series of approvals for gauging the internal confidential data? Um, we are super, super, super strongly governed around the data that we use uh, in order to, to do any form of analytics work. Um, so Nestle in all things aims to be as ethical as possible and as transparent as possible. So where we seek to use more than the normal data, like higher date and end date and, and all of that sort of stuff, um, we do specifically make sure that we have all of the approvals in place to be able to do that. And that again does vary country to country. Um, so it's, and I think particularly with a focus on data privacy uh, in HR and, and indeed outside of HR, particularly in Europe at the moment, that's becoming increasingly important. So where you are using data that does require consent, I think it's very important that, uh, that you do make sure that you have it. Um, not least because it's a legal requirement, but because as HR people, I think we have a responsibility to act very ethically in the way that we use our people's data. And I think that probably brings us to an end. Can we hand back then to you, Nina? Yes, thank you so much, Lorene and Jordan, for this insightful uh, webinar on Nestle, and also for the ingenious example with the night watch. I think that's a great story to take at the boardroom in case someone needs a little bit more illustration on people analytics and uh, you know how it actually come into a real life example. Uh, so thank you for all the questions as well. You answered, uh, I think, pretty much all of them. Uh, and I would agree with one of the last comments here that you guys are doing an absolutely amazing job. And uh, it's really a pleasure to have you at our first uh, HR Summit Digital Week here in the Middle East. Um, just to give heads up to everyone, uh, Jordan will be here, will be joining us in November, uh, on the 12th of November as part of our speaker lineup at the HR Summit and Expo, uh, which will be here in Dubai. So you're more than welcome to join us and see him face to face and ask any additional questions you might have now after this webinar. Um, also, a few of, uh, of you asked about the recordings. Yes, there, there will be recordings sent to you uh, probably by the end of today or uh, latest tomorrow. You would receive uh, uh, an email with uh, access to the recording of this webinar. Um, also, quick reminder, we've got an, another webinar uh, tomorrow, which will be focused on e-learning, and it will start at 3 p.m. Uh, UAE time, so make sure you tune in with us again. Um, so that's it from me. Again, thank you so much, Jordan and uh, Lorene, for joining us, and uh, I look forward to seeing you, Jordan, here in, in November in Dubai. Looking forward to seeing you, too. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Have a great day and see you tomorrow at 3 p.m. Dubai time for our next uh, webinar.